So, um, the place we make. Um, when I first got asked to do this, I thought I could use the examples of some of our, our projects to, to try and illustrate this. And then I kind of thought, actually, maybe that's not right because it's a bigger question than that. It's a bit, bit wider than just workspace and providing affordable studios. And also, I talk about them a lot and I get quite bored of repeating the same things again. So I started thinking more about a couple of examples that I could use to try and illustrate what I thought about the place we make. And I don't have the answers to all the problems I think we're facing. Uh, to be honest, I'm not sure I know sometimes what the questions are. Um, but hopefully, this might give us something to start talking about. So, uh, Ward's Corner. Um, I don't pretend to be an expert on it, but I I've, I've know a fair bit about it. So, I apologize to anybody that is an expert on Ward's Corner that will uh, tell me that I've got some stuff wrong. But um, Ward's Corner is a really interesting site, not far from here, just down the road. Um, and part of a regeneration of Seven Sisters that's kind of coming through. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history, but it's not necessarily the history of the building. It's the history of the planning process that's been going on here, because I think it's quite interesting about how long it's taken. So it was originally a department store, closed in 1972, and then we'll fast forward to 2004, when Haringey and Granger, Granger's a big development company, put together and started to do site assembly of the area to see what they could bring forward as a big regeneration package. 2007, uh, they signed a conditional development agreement, which basically means that they're going to bring it forward together. 2008, they get planning. 2010, the planning gets quashed. 2012, they get planning again. 2015, they start to do CPOs, compulsory purchase orders on other assets around there. Uh, 2017, they start trying to work it out. Whilst all this is going on, there's something else that's really important and really interesting in this site, which is the Latin village, which some of you may or may not know about. It's one of those really exciting things about London, where you get these groups of people coming together. And the Latin village is a, is, is a, well, it's a market as one. It's a place where people work. It's a place where lots of people are kind of coming together and sharing stuff. It's one of those like, beautifully messy areas of London. I mean that as a compliment. Not in a negative way. Um, that's owned by TfL. So TfL also owned 25% of this site. So you, have, you start to see, you start building up this picture of all these different organisations that are stakeholders. So here we go. There's the beautiful CGI, which developers love to do. Um, looks great, doesn't it? Here's the Seven Sisters Market, there's the Costa Coffee, all that kind of crap. Um, sorry, excuse me. Um, so, Granger on their website, they tell us they're delivering 196 new homes. That's great. 290 jobs, a purpose-built market, community spaces, discounted rents for the market, people who are working there at the moment. A really clever plan to move people from one site and then back to this site when it's, when it's developed out. Uh, there's a steering group, you know, one of those really important things where everybody has a voice. And all of this is enshrined within the Section 106. Section 106 is the... Uh, the, in, the, in, in the planning between the agreement between the council and the developer about what's coming forward. So that all sounds great. You know, development finished in 2020, 2022, sorry. Um, and you've got this nice, shiny new thing. So on the face of it, you think, well, that's, that's, a, that's a good thing. Granger perhaps are doing something decent. Then you start looking at the other people, the other, the other, the other stakeholders in this. So let's look at the community. It doesn't take much... Googling to find out what's going on from the community's point of view. Um, <coughs> so, a, a online crowdfunding for justice to fight the CPO. Okay, so that doesn't sound very good. <laughs> According to that, there's also zero zero affordable housing on this site. Again, that sounds pretty pretty bad. Unlawful evictions of market traders. It's all building a pretty negative picture. And then there's also a UN statement on the 26th of March, 2019, that's pretty heavyweight, saying the local authorities' involvement in the project had failed to adequately assess and mitigate the impact of the project on the cultural rights of minorities, including children. That's a pretty damning statement, you know, on this thing. You know, if you've got, if you've got the <laughs> United Nations writing a letter, an open letter, about a development that's happening. So, 
it's totally disconnected. It's all over the place, isn't it? You've got the community over here, you've got the developer over here. And sitting somewhere in the middle of all this is the local authority. Now, I work quite a lot in London across lots of different boroughs and lots of different local authorities. And for everything... Oh, sorry. So there's the next slide. And I think that illustrates the difference between the developers and CGIs and what the community thinks. You know, if you just look at those two slides, they're, they're miles apart. Anyway, back to local authorities. So Haringey. Haringey is trying, I think, to do good stuff. They're underfunded. They're under-resourced. They have constant cuts coming from central government. As we know, this is happening across the board everywhere. So they're trying to make things work, and they're trying to bridge, I think, in a lot of ways, this, this disconnect between local people, communities, and what they need and what developers need. And back to our last talk, the, the financial thing is often what makes this really challenging. I don't think it needs necessarily to be like that. And again, I'm not saying which side is right or which is wrong. Um, I certainly don't think Haringey are trying to make this more difficult than it needs to be for the people around there. Um, and I do feel, feel quite, quite sort of... I guess sorry is, is possibly the word I'd use for that. Um, so that, I think, is an example of not doing this very well. Okay, So not early engagement, not working these problems through, not understanding all the different people that need to be involved. Now... <coughs> I, looked, I was looking around for a project that I thought did do this quite well. And that was one that I was lucky enough to visit a few years ago in, um, in New York. Uh, I decided that I would go off and look at what was going on in different countries, different cities around the world, to see how they were trying to solve these, these issues and these problems. So I went to New York and I got introduced to Placeful in New York. So this is an organisation that starts very, very early engagement between developers, local authorities, communities. Um, that's where I think you start to, to really make a difference. Uh, so this is a project which is called Artspace. It's called PS109. Uh, PS stands for public school. Uh, it was a public school uh, in uh, East Harlem in... Um, El Barrio. Mm. So schools, obviously, they're one of those kind of institutions that are like hearts of the community, aren't they? You know, everyone remembers their time at school, and that's kind of what it all feeds into. So this school is a beautiful old building, and although it's gorgeous, it's knackered. So the heating didn't work, it leaked, you know, all of those kind of things. So local council built a new school. Great. Let's move all the kids to the new school. Off they go. What should we do with the asset? So the guys in property are thinking, brilliant, we get a nice cash receipt for this. We'll sell it to a developer, we'll get them in, get it off the books, get some more money in the coffers. What Sean does is he works with the early stages of this. So before, before these disposals happen, you can go in and you can start to build a consensus between the local authorities, local communities. And then you can start to see how you can fund them. And the last talk was saying how difficult it is with the values, the, the land values are really hard to work with. And of course, that's the same across the world. So they came in quite early, and with a, a grant fund of a million dollars, they started working this up. Okay, so you need quite a lot of cash to start coming forward with the ideas later on. So that million, million dollars enabled Sean, his team, and the local community to start putting together this stuff. Now, the project itself, the final scheme, is it's a $52 million project. It's quite a lot of money. So how did they do that? They used some small amount of charitable donations. 6% of this came from charitable donations. The rest are from, from traditional funding and financing tools. And when you start thinking about how you can do that in certain areas, it is possible, I think, to, to bridge it. You can find developers and you can work with local authorities to make this happen. Um, Sean, although, uh, had a very nice uh, thing that they have in the States where you can sell tax credits if you're a charitable organisation. So he kind of bundled them up, sold them off, and funded quite a lot of this in his debt stack with that. That doesn't happen here, unfortunately. Um, the other really interesting thing about this is they did manage to do it, and it's locally owned, locally operated, locally developed, a bit like Start. And I think if you start looking at how you can put these things together, they do, they do really work. 
There's also 80 units here, 80 apartments. Okay, that's 80 families, people that have somewhere to live and somewhere to work, because they're live-work units. Um, they're $1,200 a month, so they're genuinely affordable. I, I'm sure you'll realize New York is very expensive. $1,200 a month is, is insane. I was talking to Sean as well about, about you know, what this meant, you know, the, uh, the collaboration. You know, how do you get all these things to, to work together? What's the best thing about it? What's the most difficult thing? The toughest, he said, was weaving together all these multiple agencies, these multiple goals. You know, finance, community, local authorities, the people, the spaces. And I was like, well, that makes sense. Of course it is. That's going to be. And then I said, what's the, what's the best thing about it? And he gave me the same answer. You know, the, the, the challenges become the rewards. And I think if you can start folding that through into what we're doing or trying to do here and places, the places we make, the places we're trying to make, you start to have those, um, those rewards. Um, and then uh, you start thinking about the people. And I was lucky enough, as I said, to go here and, and meet all these people. And these spaces are really, really lovely. They're beautiful apartments that are really well crafted, with space for people to work and live. And it's a really interesting way, I think, of ensuring that a community stays within a place and builds on that place. Um, and to me, I think that's what you know, the place we make is all about. It's, about. it's about the communities, and it's about using the tools that we can find and we can have to make them better places. And, um, and, and that's it. So thanks for listening. <laughs>